Welcome. Today we're going to look at robot motion planning. Two important concepts are roadmaps and configuration spaces, and we first have, we'll have a look at those. Then in terms of computing configuration spaces, we're going to look at Minkowski sums and how to compute them and how to compute their union. And then finally, for shortest pass, we're going to look at visibility graphs and an algorithm for computing the visibility graph. We have a robot which wants to go somewhere. So that is our problem. Given a robot with some start position and we have a, a region with obstacles, this robot wants to find a path to the goal position, avoiding the obstacles. Yeah, so for instance, a path like this. And for this problem, it's of course important to know what kind of shape the robot has, what kind of shape the obstacles have, what kind of motion the robot can do, Maybe the obstacles also move. And then there's also the question of whether we're working in 2D or 3D. So very often we can think of 2D movement because let's take this robot here. The third dimension doesn't really add much um, as in this robot isn't doing anything with the third dimension. So we can really just think of, of it moving in a two dimensional plane. Okay, so simplest variant we could think of is the following, let's say our robot is actually just a point. Obstacles are polygonal, otherwise it would be really boring. Um, let's say the robot can only translate that for a point shaped robot that doesn't really make a difference. Later, if, you, if the robot actually has a shape, then it's also relevant whether it rotates, but okay, for now it just translates. And obstacles don't move. Actually, today obstacles will never move. In what we are going to talk about, obstacles won't move, obviously. In, in general, obstacles might move. And we are also always looking at the 2D case. Okay, so how could we solve this? And uh, this is actually a fairly simple setting. So uh, with the geometric tools that you already know, you will be able to solve this. So somehow we, we, we need to kind of make sure that the robot goes around obstacles. And for that, it's easiest if I mean, right now it's in a big phase and it's a bit difficult to see what where to move next. But the way we can solve this is that we reduce it to a, a shortest path problem in a graph. And that is the roadmap that um, we're going to see next. So instead of having this robot moving freely in space, we're going to construct a graph and then no matter where we want to move it, the movement will be on that graph. And to compute this graph, we're going to use the vertical decomposition. So compute the vertical decomposition of the obstacle segments and remove everything that is inside of the obstacles. Now you have the vertical decomposition of the space as such. Okay, now so we still need to have a graph. What we're going to do is we're going to add one vertex in every face, so simply in the middle of the face. And additionally, we're going to add a vertex on each vertical extension, in the middle of each vertical extension. Then we're going to connect every face with its uh, vertical or with the vertices on its vertical extensions. And that is a graph that we're going to look at. And such a graph, so a graph on which we, you let the robot navigate, that's called a road map. And now what we need to do is just, we need to first locate the face, uh, so the trapezoid that contains the start we need to locate the trapezoid that contains the goal position. And then the robot simply moves to, so let's do that here. Here was our robot. This is the vertex of the start. It moves, can move to that start. And okay, eventually, if it manages to find the face or the trapezoid, um, the goal is contained in, then it is easy to move to the goal. And now we just need to have a shortest path in G from this vertex to that vertex. And for that, you can use whatever algorithm you want to use. For instance, so shortest passes here just min in terms of numbers, number of edges traversed. So that could be, for instance, a breadth first search that you'll be using there. Here you see as an example, oh, this might be the shortest path. So you go to the vertex of the face, you go uh, via uh, the vertex of a vertical extension, then to the next phase, vertical extension, next phase, and so on. And eventually this path reaches a goal. 
So far so good. Is this algorithm correct? So what do we need to answer if we want to know whether the algorithm is correct? We need to make sure that if there is a path, we also find a path. And the path that we find that that is actually does not hit any obstacles. So why does a path that we are using does not hit obstacles? Let's think about that briefly. So, I mean, from start to a position in the same trapezoid. Trapezoid is a convex object. I cannot hit anything. Likewise, this vertex and this vertex are both part of the same I mean, trapezoid. I mean, one is on the boundary, but still. And again, the trapezoid is convex, so everything in between is also in the trapezoid, so we're fine. And the same argument applies for anything on this path. Indeed, our path does not hit any obstacles. So if we, in particular, if we find a path, then actually a path exists. And if a path exists, yeah, let's say, do a, such a proof. So let's assume a path exists. Let me draw a path that exists. So it should have been stayed inside. Okay. Then I can simply look at, yeah, now let's shortcut it here. Uh, let's look at the trapezoids traversed by this path. So this goes here, 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 here. Then obviously there's also a path in my graph that follows simply that sequence of trapezoids. Okay, so algorithm is correct. What is the running time? So what is the running time of all this on a scene with obstacles that have overall complexity n. Is it expected um, of order log n or of order n log n or of order n squared? It is of order n log n. So why is that the case? Let's just have a look at what the running time of the various steps are. We compute a vertical decomposition that takes up all order n log n. Okay, we're moving a segment of the, 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 the of in with an obstacle that takes linear time. Computing the graph based on the vertical decomposition, we can also do in linear time. Locating start and go uh, takes order log n time. And then finding the shortest path, let's say we do a breadth first search, takes linear time. Okay, and as you see, the dominating term here is a n log n. So we have our first result, namely if we have polygonal obstacles with overall n edges, then we can pre-process them in n log n time such that given a point-shaped robot that wants to go from start to go, we can compute a collision-free path in linear time if it exists. It is the shortest path in the graph, at least shortest in, in whatever, let's say we did a breadth first search, shortest in terms of number of trapezoids traversed. It is not the actual shortest path, as it, you also see in this example, so probably the shortest path here would look something like, let's say, this path. Here. So it would kind of here just go around that obstacle and directly to there. So this was for point-shaped robots. Most robots are not points. A polygon is already much better to estimate kind of the shape of a robot. So this robot, we could kind of take something like a rectangle as a shape. And we're going to ha see how to handle that case. Next, we're going to look at configuration spaces. And we're going to look at them in the context of the following robot motion planning problem. This is what we previously had, just that now also the robot has a polygonal shape. Yeah, so you can, if you think again of this robot here, its movement is essentially in the plane. Um, and from that perspective, it's essentially a rectangle. So for this robot, we could model it or, or take as a shape a rectangle. The obstacles are also polygonal, we assume. The motion um, for the motion, we only allow translations. So in, in, in the context of the robot, it can move like this, right and left, up and down. It won't rotate. Rotations, we're going to look at later. Uh, beyond that, obstacles aren't moving 
and as we already seen we're in 2D and we, the question is can a polygonal robot move from a start position to a goal position avoiding polygonal obstacles in between. And for this we need the concept of configuration spaces. So first of all we start with the workspace. The workspace is the space where we actually have the obstacles and the robot. So in blue we have here the obstacles, they are rectangles or one of them to be specific a square and then the red object here that is my robot. So that's the workspace but we're going to look at the problem in the configuration space and what does that mean? The configuration of a robot is, is essentially the state in which the robot is and the state in our setting because we only have translations is essentially where it currently is. So that uh, describes the position of the robot. So if, if, if initially my robot sat here yeah, and let's say this dot here that's zero to be precise zero zero because then 2D. Now I can describe the state of my robot completely by telling you where this black dot has moved. So if I tell you this black dot has moved here and because my robot only translates I exactly know where my robot is. I exactly know that it is here. So that's a configuration. In this context we always talk about degrees of freedom. So what is degrees of freedom? That is simply the number of parameters uh, that I need to describe the, the configuration, to specify the configuration. So in this example, we, we, we are in 2D, we only have translations. So um, as we see, um, I need two coordinates. So degrees of freedom is two. If we would have translations and rotations, then, I mean, it's not enough if I tell you the robot has moved to here, but you also need to know in which direction it is facing. And this direction, that's one more parameter. I mean, that's an angle. So for translation and rotations, the degrees of freedom is three. Now, if I have trans translations in 3D, then I can move essentially as in 2D, but I also have the third um, axis. So then the degrees of freedom is three. And if I have translation and rotations in 3D. So think of a drone. Yeah, how many degrees of freedom do we have? We have essentially for one the translation. So where is it? That's already three. And then the number of rotations that we have is I can kind of tilt uh, sideways, uh, sideways. I can go like up and down. Um, and then I can also have this turning. So that's th three more. So there we have six degrees of freedom. Let's do this as a quiz. Here I have the following robot. It um, So here it stands on the ground, so that doesn't move. This also is static here. Okay, and then you see how it moves, can be move uh, beyond that. So looking at this robot, how many degrees of freedom does it have? Two, four, or six? The degrees of freedom are two. Namely, we have an angle here, we have an angle there. Two degrees of freedom. That's it. So those are configuration and the degrees of freedom. So now I look at the configuration space and that is essentially a space. The dimension of that space corresponds to the degrees of freedom. So here for translations we have two degrees of freedom, we have a two-dimensional configuration space and that's simply the space of my configurations. Uh, so here, instead of having a robot at a certain position and a robot at another position, we simply have the positions or the configurations. If I want to do computations in the configuration space, I need to make sure that the obstacles somehow also adhere to the configuration space. That means I need to make sure to kind of uh, have the obstacles in such a way that if my robot here, so if I would go like this, then this would bump into my obstacle. Therefore, I really want to make sure that in the configuration space, my obstacles, my configuration space obstacles are such that I bump into such an obstacle exactly if in the workspace I would have bumped into one of such obstacles. And for that, this obstacle needs to be blown up as, as illustrated here. And we have to see still how to compute that. Because now, 
if if I now here have a path, so this path here, for instance, that will then also be a valid path in my uh, workspace. So what I want to have is I want to have obstacles in configuration space such that there is a path into the configuration space exactly if there's a path in the workspace. And the, the obstacles in configuration space, that is then also called the forbidden space, and the space that remains that is called the free space. Now, we want to know what the free space is, so we have to think about what does a free space look like. Okay, it's much easier actually to look at, to ask the question, how does a forbidden space look like? Um, so the free space as such is simply the complement of the union of the forbidden spaces of all obstacles. Meaning, what do we need to have? We need to A, for an obstacle, be able to compute how does the forbidden space, so how does a configuration space obstacle look like? And then B, later we have to be able to take the union of such forbidden spaces. And you can somewhat imagine that if, if I now look at this right obstacle, so, I mean, essentially, intuitively, what I would be doing is I, I look at this robot. At this point, it would bump into the obstacle, or this would be actually, this is called a semi-free location because it, 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 the robot can be there, but here then also uh, constrained by its movement by the obstacle. And here at this point, um, the position of the robot would be here. And of course, if I would move it up slightly, now I'm still in the setting. I cannot move into the further into the obstacle, and so on. And if I if I do this um, essentially everywhere here, I get this shape, and and in particular the vertices of this shape you recognize as being where the robot kind of moves from one. So here it slides along that edge, and then here it continues. This si side now slides along that edge. So these are it's a forbidden space of an obstacle and uh, okay the the math here or the just uh, the mathematical description of the forbidden space of an obstacle is the it's all the points x y such that r so the robot for the configuration x y intersects the obstacle now we want to compute this and for this we're going to look at minkowski sums